Welcome to Sheep Connect SA 10 minute talk on pregtoxemia and hypercalcemia. I'm Jodie Rizzo O'Brien, part of the Sheep Connect SA team. Today, our speaker is Dr. Sean McGrath from the Millicent Vet Clinic. Thanks, Sean. Okay, so this morning uh, we're going to talk about uh, pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia. So, pregnancy toxemia is also known as twin lamb disease, and it generally occurs in late pregnancy. Uh, what you might see uh, in the sheep is down or lethargic ewes, and so they um, can be unable to rise. They look like they might have weak front legs, but uh, it's more that they just can't, don't have the energy to get up. Uh, if they are up and around, they don't have a lot of energy and they can be a bit glassy in the eye and, uh, and look not quite with it. So we've got a video here, which uh, shows a ewe with pregnancy toxemia. And so you can see that um, she's, while she's standing, she uh, is pretty non-responsive. Um, she doesn't want to move. She takes a lot of pushing to move her around. Um, she just is, is lacking a lot of energy. And if you take a bit of notice there of her condition score, she is quite light on it um, and reasonably poor in condition. She's also been in the yards for a day or two for shearing and um, she's probably uh, reasonably heavily in lamb. And um, we'll talk more about these factors in a moment. But that's what a, uh, a you with pregnancy toxemia can look like. Um, so just noting that really lethargic movement and uh, not responding to your stimulus too much. So what is pregnancy toxemia? So at the end of the day, it's purely an energy deficiency. Uh, there's just not enough feed coming into the animal or available to the animal for them to meet their energy requirements. Um, as we said, us it usually occurs in ewes. And so what happens is they, uh, they start to mobilise their body reserves to, uh, to meet their own energy demands. And as they mobilise these body reserves, um, there's a few uh, byproducts which can sort of depress their nervous system and their, um, and their function of their nerves and the rest of their muscles. So yeah, it's really an energy deficiency and we need to make that really clear. So what's, what's causing this mismatch in energy? So it really is uh, supply and demand. So in late, uh, late pregnancy, demand for energy increases from the ewe having to feed those fetuses. And this is more so in twins or even triple bearing ewes. So um, as they get closer to pregnancy, there's more energy that needs to go into growth of these fetuses. And so the ewe uh, needs to supply that energy. And if this coincides with low supply, of energy, which is coming from the feed, that's when we can get the, the problem of pregnancy toxemia. So low supply would be low feed on offer or poor partial quality. So there could be a lot of fit, a lot of dry matter, but it was poor quality. And this can quite often be due to when we're, when we're lambing. A quick note on what are the energy requirements in this last, in this late pregnancy for use um, in terms of megajoules. Um, in the last month of pregnancy, depending if they're single or twin bearing, that could be anywhere from 14 to 18 megajoules of energy. And so if we equate this to a amount of good quality pastures, so not pasture in the middle of summer, this is pasture in sort of winter and spring, they need you know, up to 1.4 to 1.8 kilograms of pasture. And so what you need to ask yourself is, do you have the pasture amount and the pasture quality to achieve this? And if you don't, then you need to start to think about, well, I need, do I need to supplement these sheep? Because at the end of the day, and we'll talk about this in a moment, supplementation of feed is the only way to prevent or solve the problem. So if you haven't got the, the pasture to supply this amount of energy, you need to supplement the, the use. And that can either be through grain, hay or silage, but it all needs to be uh, adding up to the amount of megajoules of energy that's required. If you do have um, ewes that are down or sick with pregnancy toxemia, uh, there are these treatments for the individual animals. So um, on, the, on the top right is, uh, is Ceton, which, or the other product that's available is Ketol, and that's a pink oral drench, which is an energy supplement specific for ruminants. Um, on the bottom left-hand corner is the Vitrate um, liquid concentrate, which is an electrolyte concentrate, but um, helps with some returning some electrolytes and also helps absorb the, the ceton better. And then there's um, the four in one or dextron flow packs, which we can put under the skin. And so when it comes to prevention, um, like I said, the main prevention is feed. There's no, no magic bullets here. Um, some people get it confused with, uh, with licks and feed additives being, being the preventative uh, 
magic bullet, but at the end of the day, it's purely feed. So that's either grass, if there's not enough grass, and you need to look at, at grain, silage or hay and making sure that there's enough feed to match, that, to match those energy requirements. And if you're gonna be, if you need to supplementary feed, then you need to, to get it right. So um, we've got the, those images for lifetime new management courses. So they are a great way to learn how much supplementary feed you need to, be, need to be doing. And if you're gonna bother to do it, I think you need to spend some time and doing some calculations and getting it right. And the other thing to, to look at in terms of prevention is body condition score targets. So, um, so making sure that your ewes are an adequate body condition score at the time of lambing, that will give them um, enough energy and body reserves to draw down upon when they start to run out of energy being supplied in the feed. And so we know uh, from lifetime ewe work that as body condition score drops below two and a half, the ewe mortality rates go up. And a lot of this is probably driven by, by pregnancy toxemia. So, so feed, supplementary feeding and body condition score targets are the, the key ways to prevent it. We just look now to hypocalcemia. This is also known as milk fever. And um, this purely is a, is a low blood calcium. What you might see on farm is, uh, is some down use, um, can be similar to, uh, to pregnancy toxemia, but if they up, are up and about, unlike the pregnancy toxemia where they're pretty depressed, lethargic, the ewes can have some jerky sort of movements and be a bit twitchy. And you may also see some lambing difficulties. Um, calcium is required for muscle function. And so if they're a bit low in calcium, they can have um, some lambing difficulties in terms of trying to push those lambs out. Uh, but the main thing that we probably see is, um, is down ewes or uh, ewes that are a bit jerky in their movements. So this is a picture of a, uh, of a ewe that has hypocalcemia. She's obviously sitting down and, and unable to get up. Uh, we have another video here uh, of, a, of a ewe with hypocalcemia. She's unable to move. She's sort of in a bit of a comatose state. And if you can just see there, her, um, her ear was twitching quite a bit. And this just got these fine sort of tremors and fasciculations across her body. And uh, that's what we generally see with, with hypocalcemia. Once again there, hopefully you can just see that ear twitching a little bit, which is a bit different to that ewe that had the, uh, the pregnancy toxemia at the start. Here's another video of a ewe that, with hypercalcemia. Once again, that is up, that she can move around, but she's a little bit jerky in her movements. And so um, once again, different to the pregnancy toxemia where uh, she didn't want to move at all. This one wants to move, but is quite jerky and un uncontrolled or incoordinated in her movement. And, uh, and that can be a little bit of the difference between um, pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia. So what's happening with hypocalcemia in sheep? In the last uh, trimester of gestation, there's a big draw of calcium that goes from the ewes reserves into the fetus. Uh, as those fetuses start to make bones, they need calcium. And so they need to get that from the ewe. And so they suck that out of the ewe. It's a little bit the same as the pregnancy toxemia. It's a supply and demand thing. So in late pregnancy, the demand goes up and we need to make sure that we're supplying enough calcium to the ewe. Sometimes we see uh, some outbreaks and we might see outbreaks of down ewes. And this is quite often around handling. So pre-lambing uh, pre pre treatments is a really common one. And sometimes it is combined with pregnancy toxemia. So what are the risk factors for hypocalcemia? So the main ones are the, are the first uh, three or four there. So if we've got extended periods of grain feeding, so greater than six weeks, that um, increases the risk of hypocalcemia. And that's because grain is inherently low in calcium. And so what we're, if we're having to feed high levels of grain for a long period of time, we're purely just not giving enough calcium to the ewes. And when that uh, starts to combine with late pregnancy and that big draw of calcium out of the ewe, then there's not enough reserves for the ewe to draw upon. Older ewes, so greater than five-year-old, they are at higher risk. Once again, their body reserves are a bit less and uh, this can compound over a few years. So if there's extended periods of grain feeding over a couple of years, um, their reserves will be depleted because they just haven't uh, had enough intake. Twin-bearing ewes are a bit more risk as well, uh, a bit similar to the pregnancy toxemia story and that two lambs are drawing more calcium out of, the, out of the ewe. And then we have stress. So any handlings in the last four weeks of pregnancy can tip ewes over the edge. And around those handlings, if we have them off feed for greater than 12 hours, we can also run the risk of tipping them over the edge. And so a common scenario that, uh, that we hear is people bringing, 
bringing ewes in for pre-landing treatments in that, within that last four weeks and having them around the yards for a day and maybe overnight or extended periods of time where they're sort of off feed or on very minimal feed. And that can quite often be enough to tip them over the edge and we end up with down ewes and ewe mortalities. The bottom few risk factors there are sort of secondary ones, but uh, you know they can play a role and that's to do with soil pHs and, and soil phosphorus sort of tying up the calcium and not making it available to the sheep or extremes in feed on offer and extremes in body condition scores. So if we've got those things combining as well, we can have, um, have some increased risk of hypercalcemia. So what are we gonna do about it? We talk mainly about supplementation. We wanna be targeted in our situation. So if we have, um, if we have grain feeding going on for more than six weeks pre-lambing, then it's, it's uh, pretty important to supplement with some sort of uh, calcium into the ration. Uh, the other situation which is high at risk is, is lactating ewes on grazing cereals or, or irrigated ryegrass. Um, those fodders or those forages are once again inherently low in calcium and with a lactating ewe that is, uh, have a big demand for calcium, they can end up in uh, hypocalcemia. So the way to supplement is either through, through commercial loose slicks or homemade loose slicks, which uh, involves uh, stock lime and salt. Uh, once again, you can either make them yourself or you can buy them commercially, or you can add limestone so, or stock lime to grain at 1%, and you can uh, add that in as you feed it out or put it into your feed cart. In terms of, uh, in terms of treating the individual animals, if you have them down, um, like the pictures and the videos, uh, using the four-in-one um, under the skin, those four-in-one flow packs, will generally result in, in the use to get up. Not always, but that's the best and only thing we can do for individual treatments and uh, can be pretty successful. So how do you tell the difference between the two, just to summarize? So the difference in movement is, uh, it can, uh, can tell us what's the difference between pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia. So in preg tox, they're a bit slower in their movement. They're not as responsive to, to us stimulating them. Whereas hypocalcemia, they're a bit more jerky. As I sort of showed in those videos, when they're down, the hypocalcemia ones have those twitching and muscle fasciculations, whereas a pregnancy toxemia one will just be, will be down um, and not really responsive. A response to four in one. So this is a good way, good little way to tell. So if we've got a down you and we put some four in one under the skin, if it's just hypocalcemia, they will get better and, and generally will hop up and run away. Um, and that might take 10 or 15 minutes for that to work. If you do a post-mortem and you can do a quick one at home yourself, um, if you've got down use or dead use, if you cut them open and there's twins present, there's a fair chance that it's probably pregnancy toxemia. Uh, and then there's also blood tests and lab, lab tests that we can do uh, through vet clinics, um, which can either be uh, the blood out of the live animal, or if you have animals that are dead within 24 hours, um, we can get some fluid from the eye and that can tell us um, whether the calcium is low or whether there's some markers for um, pregnancy toxemia. So there's some little ways to try and tell the difference. It can be hard to tell the difference. Uh, and quite often we do see the two things together, but um, yeah, we could certainly um, tease it apart and tell the difference between the two. So that really wraps, the, wraps up this little talk. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the key messages for hypercalcemia and pregnancy toxemia. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for sharing your insight and expertise. 